morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisbeth Tapia, and I'm the CHCI DeVita Health Graduate Fellow. I'm delighted to be with you here today for a journey to health, innovation in mental health treatment, and addiction recovery. This is a very important topic to me personally because there are numerous barriers to recovery that make it inaccessible for those most, most affected. These barriers are even larger for communities of color and other marginalized groups. Therefore, having these conversations on how we can propose equitable treatment solutions is one of the first steps to ensuring better health outcomes for everyone affected by mental health issues and addiction. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Commonwealth, Ashley Treatment Center, and Osuka Pharmaceutical for their generous support of this session. I'm delighted to introduce our session chairs, Senator Ben Ray Lujan and Congresswoman Grace Napolitano, who will both give opening remarks. Senator Ben Ray Lujan has represented New Mexico in the United States Senate since January 2021. He has previously served as U.S. Representative for New Mexico's 3rd Congressional District and House Assistant Speakers in the 116th Congress. Senator Lujan has fought to increase New Mexicans' access to quality health care, no matter where they live or how much money they make. He signed legislation into law to bolster the Children's Health Insurance Program and strengthen Medicaid and Medicare. Please welcome Senator Ben Ray Lujan. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be with you. Muy buenos dias. I want to thank and recognize my colleague who is here. She's a friend. She's a mentor. Anyone that has worked with her and knows her um, has a very special place in your heart for Grace Napolitano um, and has also learned a tremendous amount um, of how we can help people how we can make a difference in people's lives. But the one thing I always appreciate from the lessons I've learned from Congresswoman Napolitano is she always says, if you say you're gonna do something, you better do it. Don't, don't commit to something that you cannot achieve. And it's an honor to do this with you, Grace. You've been a leader in this space for a long time. And you make a difference in people's lives and you save them. So it's an honor to be with you, Congresswoman Grace Napolitano. I also want to recognize Dr. Hernandez, Dr. Ramirez, and Dr. Inez White. Um, I don't want to uh, get some of the names wrong that I have in front of me, so I'm going to stop at that point. But also want to thank um, Ms. Ruiz and Mr. Figueroa for being with us today as well with their work and the work that they will continue to do. Um, I also want to thank uh, someone who it's his, his first time to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute um, as well. And you'll hear from him, and that's Frank Ray. Um, Frank is a songwriter. He's a performer. He's an inspiration. And this is a, a, an area where you will hear from him directly why it matters and how we can all work together to save people's lives. And what I'll learn from Frank is there's people that will listen to you and be inspired by you that I could never connect with, sir. It means a lot that you and your team are here today with all the places you could be anywhere in America, but you chose to be here to make a difference. Muchisimas gracias. Fellow New Mexican, by the way, so I'm, I'm really, really proud of that. Recently, Secretary Becerra of Health and Human Services visited New Mexico, and we had a, a round table of sorts. And there was a sophomore, a young woman, credible leader, who was on this panel, and she and her mom were there, but she was very nervous. Um, she was there to share her story through her courage of coming forward, of breaking through the stigma that often exists when it comes to mental and behavioral health. At the beginning of the round table, she was a little more quiet, but then she came out, and then she took over the round table. She was sharing these experiences and what more could be done, how we could help people, how we could lean in. But one of the things that she impressed was how important it was to be at the table. And I want that to sit in. What I mean by that, it's, it's so important that we have a diversity 
of voices represented at every table, but especially when it comes to mental and behavioral health. With the work that must be done in communities, whether we're working with professionals, we're working with developing um, medical treatments, the lack of diversity in those trials and opportunities often leaves our community behind. And through the work of this young person, she is now doing, um, she, she's giving up her time to be on the 988 line, which will save people's lives, but where she can take calls herself to help others. And that's what I, I, I said is, you know, we, we all have a role and a responsibility. And as Congresswoman Napolitano said, we all have to live up to that role and responsibility. There's pending legislation. We can work on the policy initiatives. We can make a difference here. That's a place where I know that I can do something, but I want you to challenge me, challenge us to make sure that we are doing um, uh, work in areas where maybe are not so conventional for a member of the house or a US Senator or a, a, a country star, a singer, a songwriter, make sure that you work with us to challenge us to get to that place. So everyone, thank you for what you have done, for the work you are doing, and for being here today. You will make a difference. I look forward to learning from you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Senator Lujan, for your thoughtful remarks. Our next guest is Congresswoman Grace Napolitano. Congresswoman Napolitano represents California's 32nd District, which includes the San Gabriel Valley and other parts of Los Angeles County. She was first elected to Congress in 1988 and is currently serving her 12th term. Congresswoman Napolitano is the founder and co-chair of the Congressional Mental Health Caucus. She has been active in securing mental health parity in the Affordable Care Act promoting mental health legislation, and working with prominent figures to increase funding and access to mental health services in Congress. Please welcome Congressman Grace Napolitano. Thank you very much, Ms. Tapia and Ben Ray. Thank you for your nice comments. But I've got to tell you, there's people like Ben Ray that are making a great big amount of difference uh, in mental health. And Anne, my former employee, works for him. She is also a mental health expert. And uh, certainly, we welcome Mr. Ray into the fold of mental health athletes and singers. Thank you. Uh, you know who I am. I don't have to uh, tell you who I am. I'm the co-chair of the Mental Health Caucus. Uh, my good friend, John Katko, Republican from uh, New Jersey, as, uh, as uh, from New York is uh, my co-chair that has been wonderful. He got involved because he had a problem with his niece committing suicide. So he thought he'd go to Congress to make a difference and he has made a difference and we have worked on many issues together. We have the caucus in Washington, it's 105 members strong and we're hoping to get more members. Uh, this is a bipartisan. And uh, if you have any connection with any of them, tell them to get on the caucus because the more we have, the more we can get information disseminated to their districts and uh, get the word out that it's okay to ask for help. Uh, thank you, CHEI, for inviting me. Uh, we think of mental health, and I was talking uh, just a little earlier that the first few years that we did mental health for the caucus, for the institute, we had about 20 people showing up. And mental health has grown to where now it is important that people are getting the idea that it affects everybody. And it is, COVID-19 has just made it worse. And we, we have to continue seeking the funding for it. But it, with your help, we can do that by asking our representatives to consider it because they don't talk about it, they don't hear, want to hear about it, and they don't want to speak about it. And it's, it's not fair that we are ignoring the, the mental health issue because if your brain is healthy, your body is healthy. And then in 2001, we started a program in schools with a half million dollars from SAMHSA as a pilot to put mental health services in, in three middle schools and one high school. It has now grown to 35 schools and growing. Uh, it is no longer 
uh, some funded by San Francisco, funded by the LA County, but uh, because it was a pilot, of course, and it is so popular that they have feeder schools going into the schools to treat children with mental health problems from other schools. Uh, there are a few ways we have been working to uh, address mental health in the congressional level, and that's uh, uh, the program we started in 2001. We put in a, uh, uh, the program in three middle schools and high schools, as I said, and this is to treat anything, bipolar, schizophrenia, uh, bullying, which has become quite, a, quite a, an, an, uh, an issue with youngsters. And uh, it is on a bill in Congress, H.R. 721. Make note of it because we would like your help in getting the Senate to pass it. It's passed the House, it is now in the Senate waiting to be held. Um, it is critical we provide the schools with resources to help the children deal with the issues that they have, which uh, is very important to the families as well as the children. The, uh, we know that if we started early, then the children would not have major issues when they grow up and would be addressing them at a year early stage. Um, stigma is still a big barrier, especially in the Latino community. El machismo. And we must learn that it is okay to ask for help, no matter what, because it is the health of the children in the future that we're talking about. Uh, we've, I've introduced 2529, HR 2529, Mental Health for Latinos Act to address the issue, which directs SAMHSA to develop and implement outreach and education strategy to promote mental health in the Latino community, reinforces the message that there's absolutely zero shame to speak up and ask for help. Uh, we, um, our mental health caucus work, the, mental, the membership list, and a, there's a long list of mental health bills if you want to um, uh, check in on it. It is mentalhealthcaucus-napolitano.house.gov. And it just shows you that in time, in the years that we have been working on it, they finally are getting some mental health legislation addressing the many issues that people have uh, uh, come up with. I encourage you to get involved. God bless you. Have a great session and keep working. Spread the message. Mental health is important. Thank you very much. God bless. <laughs>
here in 2022 has become something that's really more socially acceptable to talk about. There's a lot of uh, artists like myself that are open about their mental health when you're having a good day, when you're having a bad day. Um, and it can be on that very light end of the spectrum or like I saw in law enforcement on the very dark end of the spectrum where people make the very tragic decision to end their life by suicide. It's um, either way it affects every single person in this room, every single person out there in the lobby. Uh, mental health is something that we shouldn't shy away from. And I, for one, will do everything I possibly can to be a representative using my platform. Every, every single person in here, if you have social media, you have a platform to speak about it. Uh, it's something that we shouldn't shy away from. It's, it's uh, as a father, something that I want to instill in my kids. And um, you guys should do that as well because it affects every single family, friend, and loved one. So I thank you so much for being here. I shout out to New Mexico as well, Congressman Lujan, I mean, uh, Senator Lujan for, for putting forth uh, the dialogue and the legislation uh, that affects uh, everybody. So anyway, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. Y'all have a great day. Thank you so much for your remarks, Frank. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Martin Figueroa, Director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He serves as a director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs um, and is currently the principal advisor on strengthening intergovernmental relationships with the state, local, territorial, and tribal governments, as well as the private sector, nonprofit, faith-based, and other external partners to advance the administration's health and human services priorities. He is also a CHCI alum, so please help me in welcoming Martin Figueroa. Good morning, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Marvin Figueroa. I want to start off by thanking uh, panel chairs, Senator Ben Ray Lujan, Congresswoman Grace Napolitano, and Frank Ray for their opening remarks and insightful comments about this important issue. And thank you to CHCI for an already engaged in conference and focusing attention on mental health treatment and addiction recovery. I don't have to tell you all how important this is, not only for our country, but also for our community. We know that Latinos who experience addiction themselves, the journey to helping and healing can be hindered by socioeconomic, educational, and other disparities. So it is an understatement to say on behalf of Secretary Becerra, Secretary of Health and Human Services, we are so proud and so glad that we're having this conversation. And I'm joined today by an incredible panel, which I am going to go ahead and introduce. And I ask you to hold your applause until the end. Uh, but please welcome Dr. Aaron Ramirez. He is a clinical psychologist employed at the Ashley Addiction Treatment Center. He has, he has been at the treatment center for over seven years, working with, the, with emerging adults, the primary program, and with relapsed patients. Wave, you wave for me? He's the only gentleman on the, <laughs> on the panel. <laughs> Uh, next, we welcome Dr. Ines Ruiz White, who is the lead of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Osuka Pharmaceutical. She is responsible for leading efforts to enhance diversity in clinical trials. And then we also have Ms. Ruiz, who is a policy associate at the Children's Partnership. She works with mental health on the health uh, mental health policy team, with the goal of ensuring that all children and youth have their social and emotional health needs met in an equitable and holistic manner. Please join me in welcoming the panel. So we're going to start off with Dr. Ruiz White. Um, I would love for you to set the table for us. What are some of the root causes of addiction and mental health disorders? Yes, thank you. So just to put this in perspective for the audience here, there are 10.4 million Hispanic Latinos that have been identified, and this is in 2020, to have either a mental health um, illness disorder or a substance use disorder. And of that, 5.4, I'm sorry, 2.4, have both a mental health and substance use disorder. So it's really something that um, can, you often see, um, see go hand in hand. 
Um, some of the root causes I, uh, we have seen or have been identified um, to have this is really been one, um, treatment, access to treatment. Um, in the Hispanic Latino community, um, one, we generally don't uh, seek uh, mental health treatment by specialties. Our, our treatment generally comes from our primary care provider. Um, and that can sometimes cause delays in diagnosis, um, improper treatment for the diagnosis. Um, we've also seen that generally um, we end medications um, prematurely um, at higher rates than other race and ethnic groups. Uh, we generally are getting seeking treatment and more in an emergency situation. So definitely access to treatment, um, proper diagnosis is a, is a root cause here. Um, second, finances. Um, we know that generally the Hispanic community have higher rates of lower poverty, um, poverty have higher poverty rates, um, low, lower social economic status. Um, so I work in clinical trials. Out-of-pocket costs can um, run up to $1,000 to be part of a routine clinical trial. So those participants are not going to be those that are working hourly, um, minimum wage, um, time, transportation, child care. Those are all factors. So definitely um, impacts of social determinants of health. And third, I would say it's going to be um, immigration and incarceration. So with immigration, there's trauma that comes from migrating um, from different um, countries coming into this. Um, essentially, it's going to be isolation that many immigrants feel once they arrived. Um, there has been reports that actually the mental health of, is actually lower the longer you stay in the United States um, for immigrants. So um, that's definitely a root cause and incarceration. We know that blacks are incarcerated five times more than whites, Hispanics three times more. However, in um, the prison systems um, for females, um, basically, 31% have a serious mental illness compared to 4%, 5% outside of the prison system. So we know that incarceration is definitely a root cause there. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz. And Dr. Ramirez, uh, Dr. Ruiz talked about the obstacles and some of the challenges. Um, can you talk about the work that you do at the center to address these issues? And what can we do more of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, first of all, it's a uh, privilege to be here and thank you everyone. Um, for coming and you know just focusing on this issue because it is such an important um, topic to address you know in our country and so Ashley so I work at Ashley Addiction Treatment and we started in 1983 uh, there was a Catholic priest by the name of Father Martin and um, he was a recovered alcoholic so you know he went to the guest house and became sober and went to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, but in his whole recovery process, uh, what he wanted to do was start a treatment center to help people who struggled with alcoholism. And so over the years, um, we've grown as an agency and um, we're located in Haver de Grace in Maryland, uh, you know, an hour, about an hour north of here. And so initially, I think, um, you know, the treatment model was, uh, focused on people suffering from alcoholism. But as time went on, um, the center started to treat people who also have uh, drug problems and then, you know, co-occurring co disorders like mental health problems as well. And so, um, you know, recently I think um, our agency has, has shifted, uh, which is, which is great because um, one of the main things we're trying to do now is, is to um, include patients that are, um, you know, more diverse ethnically and racially. And so, you know, I've been up there almost eight years and for the whole treatment center to uh, move in this position, it's, you know, from the top all the way down, it has been, um, it's, it's almost like a miracle to witness, you know. So there's so many things that we're doing, but, uh, you know, i just say, you know, a couple points just to kind of keep it brief, because um, I know there's a, a lot to talk about. But I think, um, you know, one thing um, for, uh, for, for Hispanics, which, you know, one, one of the biggest problems we've seen is what you were saying, like access to treatment. Yes. Um, that, that is really huge. So, 
Um, a few things that we're doing is we're trying to reach out into communities. Um, so just to give you know one example, one of the things we've done is gone just to local churches, you know, in in the, in the area. But um, we're trying to be more expansive. So you know we're a treatment center that really treats people all across the country, and and so we have a lot of patients that come from um, D.C., a lot of patients that come from uh, West Virginia or, or Virginia. Um, all over the state of Maryland. And so there's Hispanic populations, you know, there. And so I think that's, you know, one of our future aspirations is to, um, you know, continue that endeavor. So I'll, I'll kind of, you know, be quiet here because I know I can talk a lot. <laughs> I can end up oh, talking very a lot. Comments, Dr. But Rivera. that's just, yeah, a couple of things. So. Uh, I, re I remember uh, in 2020 when I was in the governor's office in Virginia, we had to decide to go virtual in terms of schools mm -hmm. and how a lot of our thinking before we closed schools down was how do we feed our children? Yeah. Um, and it reminded me that we rely on schools for a lot, including social emotional learning. So Ayanara, I'm gonna bring you into this conversation. When you think about youth, what policy, well, how, is, how is this issue of mental health impacting our youth? And what policy changes do we need to implement to try to make progress and, and make an improvement? Um, thank you for the question, for having me today. So the issues of, the issue of mental health is definitely has, it's taken a toll on our youth and, and the pandemic, we've seen it, it's affected everybody. And unfortunately, our young people of color have exasperated needs that compared to their white counterparts, they, they don't have the same mental health concerns, but also a difference about young people of color is that they also require different different treatments and different resources that usually aren't readily available. So that is, that's actually one of the barriers that youth have expressed to us is that there is a limited scope of available mental health resources and services and supports that are available to them. Um, our organization, we advocate a lot and we work with youth and our youth-led policy council and we've developed policy recommendations that would actually expand what the both the private and the public mental health sector defines as mental health services and interventions, including the including civic engagement, including cultural and ethnic affinity practices and rituals and and these are services that youth, young people are telling us from different communities that culture, is, culture in itself is an intervention for healing. And being involved with their communities, being especially marginalized, historically marginalized communities, being able to partake in these settings are actually mental health services and supports for them. So those are some of the changes that, they're, that we're asking and they're asking as well. And I remember being in school and thinking about some of the, the children that was disciplined. And that it may not have been discipline issues, it could have been mental health issues. So talk, can you talk a little bit about how do we train teachers um, and school counselors to intervene earlier on behalf of those children that we have those diagnoses? Yes, so I think to start off with that, one of the things is there really needs to be a shift of hardening policies to policies that actually care and support their, the students within the schools. In addition to what Marvin said, there are a lot of young people of color, especially black and brown youth, that show whenever they show signs of distress, they're actually met with discipline. And that is one of the things that we need to change, is we need to ensure that the teachers and, and supportive staff are trained both in a culturally appropriate, gender affirming, and linguistically appropriate setting for their students so that they can be there and create these safe spaces where students can actually sh express their mental health concerns rather than being met with surveillance and discipline. That would be, I think, one of the, the key things that is needed for schools. And when, when medication or therapeutics are, are necessary, Dr. Ruiz, how do we ensure that we have a clinical trial base uh, that is representative of our community? Yes, yeah, so there are definitely known barriers for diversity in clinical trials. Um, we obviously have um, historical um, 
preference for those to be underrepresented um, and basically mistreated in clinical trials. So we have a mistrust factor that we have to overcome. Um, a cost factor that we have to overcome, as I mentioned, participating in clinical trials um, does have out-of-pocket costs. And so policies that are now in place where the, um, the government is mandating states um, to put um, plans in place for how they're going to have patients use Medicaid to cover routine clinical, tra um, routine clinical trials, I think is important. So factors as that. Um, also to build diversity in clinical trials, um, you talked about that community engagement. Mm -hmm. So really as sponsors, we need to one, be putting plans, being intentional about what are our goals, what is our enrollment, understanding the prevalence of the diseases um, across these different race and ethnicity groups, and then really putting in engagement um, initiatives to go out into those communities, talk to them, do disease education before we're just quickly asking them to participate into our trials. So though I think those are some definitely initiatives. One last thing I think also is um, clinical study design. How we design our trials are very important for ensuring we're being inclusive. Um, so, um, if anyone was attending um, the, the, the uh, Kamala's talk earlier, the, um, yeah. Vice President Kamala Harris, and we were talking about, um, right, there's a high incidence of diabetes in Hispanic communities. Well, that's a common exclusion criteria in clinical trials. So then you're not right now, right off the bat, before you even started a clinical trial, excluding a large population, and particularly those disproportionate in people of color. So we have to now reassess these things and reassess how we design clinical trials. Thank you, and I'm sure you're, you've been thinking a lot about this and trying to- Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And Dr. Ramirez, before I go to the audience, I heard you at the beginning talk about partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, and we have an incredible amount of organizations represented here. Talk about how do you partner and how we can partner more. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think, you know, it starts with um, just having an awareness and a motivation, you know, because at least for us, you know, mental health and drug problems are such a huge issue. And we've been dealing with this, um, you know, for so many years, but um, taking that deliberative action and, and the initiative to reach out to people, I think is critical. And so, um, that I think that's probably the first thing is where we started, you know, um, a few years ago. Um, but since then, what we've done is just, you know, to give one example, we have um, people that we call um, clinical outreach folks. So what happens is um, we'll have, you know, one person who will cover a certain region in, you know, the Northeast or, or the South of us. And what that person does is they go out to mental health clinics, They'll go out um, to churches, other agencies, individual therapists, um, other agencies who are treating mental health and, and drug addiction. And, and then we partner with them, we talk with them, and um, we end up treating this population. And so part of that uh, endeavor is for, at least on our end, is to reach out into particular communities. You know, and just like one example uh, for us is in Silver Spring, Maryland, there's a large Hispanic community, you know, and so reaching out to regions like that that maybe um, differ historically from our model, because often we'll just get into a routine, you know, of talking to this one agency up in Pennsylvania who also does mental health and drug addiction treatment, you know, so we're trying to be um, more aware and, um, but more critical in our thinking about how else can we reach folks to come out yeah, and partner with us. So I'm hearing a fair amount of meet people where they are and speak their language. Yes, yes, right, absolutely. All right, I'm gonna open it up to the audience because I have questions here and I can continue asking. Um, but I'm sure that you all you do as well. If you just raise your hand and ask your question. You don't need the red. Hi, um, my name is Veronica Bella. Thank you for being here. Um, I read a really interesting article yesterday about fentanyl taking over heroin mm. industries. And I'm wondering how prevalent this is within the Latino community. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I'm really interested in the age and kind of gender and any demographics you can give us on um, who's affected by heroin and or you know, the, the greater availability of fentanyl for mm -hmm. replacing. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question. So 
<clears throat> we're really on the front lines, you know, at the treatment center. And we see the newest trends that, you know, are developing in the country. But that is so prevalent. I don't know the exact number, like in Hispanic community, right? But it's prevalent with most of our patients who come in. So for example, they'll, they'll come in telling us um, that they're using um, heroin. And then when we test them, it's actually fentanyl. And so as probably many of you know, fentanyl is this new powerful drug um, that you can easily overdose on. And so we've seen overdose rates increase steadily over the years. You know, just a few years ago, it was 70,000. I remember because I, you know, one of the things I do is I teach with the patients, you know, we educate them. It, this was just a few years ago, it was 70,000. And now it's already 90,000 people. And that's, that contributes to like the fourth leading cause of death. You know, that's classified under accidents. But even when you look at the top 10 causes of death, or 11 now is suicide, but um, people who have mental health and, and uh, drug addiction problems contribute to a large number of all of those deaths. And even like for with COVID, for example, because, um, you know, if, you're, if your immune system is compromised through drug use, you're more likely to get um, COVID. And so that, you know, that was some published data by Nora Volkow, who's over at, you know, National Institute of Drug Abuse showing some of that. But it, it's really having an adverse impact um, on, on just not the Latino community, but I think the country as a whole, and, and it's growing you know, in different regions too. So West Coast, I know it's big on the East Coast. And, and it's a great question yeah. too, because when you think about fentanyl, you don't think about people in our communities. Uh, you think about rural New Hampshire, uh, you think about uh, rural Ohio, but you don't think about the Bronx, mm -hmm. or you think about Richmond, Virginia, or Silver Spring. So great question, and thank you for bringing that point up. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen. Uh, well, you know, as I was thinking sort of about how this, uh, thank you, as I was thinking about how this conference uh, has been uh, framed, you know, rooted in strength, achieving our dreams, I think that as Latinos, you know, our families, ourselves, when we're like, in my case, like uh, immigrant, um, we sort of go through the process of, you know, overcoming a lot of pain and just sort of like pushing through, you know, and going towards the next thing because it's not like we can afford to stop because we have to provide for our parents or we have to provide for ourselves. So like there is not a space to sort of stop and be like, hey, you know, I'm going to process, I'm going to heal, I'm going to take care of my mental health, but rather a lot of the times it's like, hey, I'm going to take this pill, I'm going to get into this addiction, all that stuff we push through, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that we do all of that, you know, as we achieve our dreams. So in addition to that, uh, we have all of the stigma that comes in mental health, like being Latino. You know, like uh, my mom, like, used to tell me, uh, during my, uh, when I migrated to the US, really traumatic process, like you mentioned, just keep going, just keep going, like, uh, valiente mijo, limpiese las lágrimas y para adelante. Uh, nowadays, I'm an adult, I have a family, I'm realizing that I need to process all that because, you know, it's going to go into my children and it's going to go into my future generations. Anyway, what I'm saying all of that is that, uh, you know, if we're talking about innovation, then, you know, what are your thoughts on overcoming that stigma, you know, of like accepting that mental health is a thing in the Latino community uh, so that, you know, we can actually not only seek that treatment, but also that we have more Latinos opening mental health clinics and so that we can have a culturally informed perspective on how to treat that from our experiences. So that's, that's my question. What are your thoughts on that, on how to innovate in that regard? Okay, so just to be clear, your question is kind of what things or solutions we can kind of engage in that would help us break the stigma barrier, well, right? So um, agree, kind of interesting point, again, in, um, in VP um, Kamala Harris um, talk, she asked a question, right? How many of you are first of something? And like the whole crowd <laughs> raised their mm -hmm. hand. 
And I think from that is automatically stigmas of we have to do something. And not only are we carrying our future generations, but we're also carrying our, our, our previous generations, right? And you're, you're doing better for your kids, but you're also doing better for your parents. And not all race groups have to have those types of thinkings, right? I won't call them burdens, but different cultural experiences. I think things that we can do to overcome that is basically we are now becoming not the minority, but the majority, but the largest right minority race. Having these conversations, I think as we had those conversations in our in the La Cocina, right, the conversations are a little different now. As we are learning more, as we are um, learning how to work in the United States, build families in the United States, becoming second now, third generations, we are now creating a different internal culture. So I think mm -hmm. in the household, we are having conversations, um, understanding. We are accepting things from different um, communities, whether it be the LGBTQ. We're having, we can have those conversations now with our younger generation. So I think trends are definitely changing. I think also as we see need, right? We, fo we put focus on where is need. If you are you know, having a massive heart attack and a broken leg, you're going to address the heart attack first, right? And now this need is just becoming so great that we have to put focus and change on it. You know, these percentage of 2%, 3% are growing, 10%, 11%, 15%. The need is just now it's so abundant we can't ignore. Um, and so now we're just really willing to have those conversations and address it. So I think a little bit of times are changing, populations and communities are changing, and we're able to now really be more um, solution driven and putting things into our schools, putting things into um, our prison systems, and then helping um, you know things in politics as well in policy. So I think all of that is now coming to how we address those stigmas and burdens. And Really quickly, if I could bring Dayanara in here. So, you know, when back in the day, let's just say back in the day, if if someone had a mental health issue, estaba loco, or tiene algo, right? Are you seeing those attitudes change in Latino parents? So, from our conversations with youth, I what they shared with us is not entirely, but the change is actually them. So, so the youth, at like the, our generations, the younger generations, those are the generations that are having the change in their thoughts. Those are the generations that are pushing their parents to have the conversations, as Dr. Ruiz just mentioned, to have these conversations in the kitchen, to, to start talking about, hey, like, we've, and some of them very much addressed, they don't like machismo. I don't, and, and they'll, they'll say like, you know what, I don't appreciate how we say certain things on the, or, or how we're viewed in a certain way. And I think when, to address the question that you asked, it, it really is um, an, a, like a learning curve for everybody. So both this generation, the upcoming generation, they, they are more open to talk about their mental health, but as they're more open, these conversations are starting to happen with older generations. And one of the things that shouldn't necessarily fall on our, on our youth, but inherently kind of is, is the education component of what is mental health? What is, like, because that, if once we address the stigma of the older generations and, and educate and, and promote positive mental health and well-being, then these conversations, the stigma in it of itself it starts to kind of go away because the younger generations are proud to share about their mental health versus older generations, not so much. It's, it's interesting to see how the children push the parents. Great response. I'm the first in my family to be a Latina PhD scientist, so thank you all for being here. My, my question and also my comment, how can we all come together to make a difference in our communities, especially for instances when you look at a newspaper, you see an ad in English when it's supposed to be targeted to our Latino community in Spanish. And I'm trying to help that because um, previously I did alcoholic liver disease research at NIH. I'm not doing research, basic science research anymore. But now I'm serving as an ambassador to write in local newspapers in Spanish to talk the language in our communities in Silver Spring, 
in Maryland, DC, Virginia. I'm originally from Compton, California. So I'm like, if I'm here, let me make a difference. And so how do we come together? Because sometimes when our families, our neighbors, our communities are diagnosed with high blood pressure, diabetes, any type of other autoimmune diseases, sometimes there's the, the acceptance, like they don't accept. But how do we create that supportive group? But also how can we bring that change in making those ads come into Spanish, in the radio, in television, and also in our local newspapers? And I'm here to collaborate. So what are your thoughts? Thank you. Can I make, I'm gonna make that the last question actually, unfortunately. Um, wish we had more time. This is an incredible discussion. So minor tweak, opportunities to collaborate. Where do you see it? How can we do it? And how can we do it during this conference? Start with you, Dr. Ramirez. No pressure. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, a couple of things come to mind. You know, the, the fact that we're here talking about this, this whole discourse, uh, is, is, it's very exciting because I have a feeling, you know, um, there's going to be connections made. People, you know, when, when we start talking like this, we realize um, all the different resources, how many people in the country are actually working, you know, together. And so I think that's a big, um, you know, connection. Uh, opportunity for us. Um, I, the other thing I was thinking about too is, yeah, the, the question about um, that you had earlier, you, that was just so well answered. I, I think the other thing I wanted to add too is, um, you know, when you think about intergenerationally, how people change over time, the, the other piece is, is through recovery. You know, so when people have access to treatment and then you see people get well, then that makes a big difference for other people to understand. You can you can act. There's a difference, you know. Like for example, in, uh, you know, uh, there's research on Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And that 12-step program is is heavily underutilized by um, diverse groups. It's I think you know the basic text in AA said it was something like th only three percent. Are represented, you know, from African American or Hispanic folks or Asian folks, um, but if if more people were to engage treatment, um, go into therapy, take medicine, start to recover, which I think we're seeing that more of as a change, then it, it makes a difference. Um, and other generations start, you know, they have a new dialogue, they have a new perspective on things, and. Um, you know, we can change. Yes. Um, I would say in my area, obviously, in trying to create innovations and treatments for mental illness, um, the collaborations are going to come in as um, more representation in our, as HCPs and our medical communities. Um, again, we talked about diagnosis and treatments. We need to be showing that people understand as you talk about um, your symptoms, they're understanding that correctly, so that representation matters there from that perspective. Um, also, health literacy matters there, right? Mm -hmm. So how you're seeing something, we're engaging them on their level and their languages. And as we know, um, the Hispanic and Latino um, cultures and dialect is very different, right? Across the one way you're going to write, it doesn't serve all community. So be intentional on where community you're trying to um, you know, help and guide have representation from those communities at your table to give them that voice, um, basically. And then pretty much for us is have that partnership with patient advocacy and for me in clinical trials, participate in clinical trials, have those conversations at your tables about clinical trials. Um, so that would be things I would, I would identify. Ms. Ruiz. Um, I want to echo the sentiment of making sure that the correct people are at the table. Uh, I work at a nonprofit and it's an advocacy organization. We do a lot of work with community engagement. We work with policymakers um, and research. And what we find ourselves doing more often now than before is making sure that we're pulling in the right community partners, whether that be the organization that serves the X population or for my work, sometimes I, I'll look at organizations that serve uh, parents that have young children with dis developmental delays or disabilities, if it's something super specific. So we're looking for the 
people that have the knowledge on certain topics because that they're the ones that are going to help us. I think in addition to that, one of the things we do is we really want to make sure that we're listening to what their community is saying. We hold different listening sessions just either for parents, for young people, just to make sure that we're, we're when we're advocating with legislators and policymakers and creating policy recommendations, we know that, hey, this is actually something that the community is saying. It's not something that, yes, the research said it, but we just want to, we double check to make sure that this is something that the constituents are saying themselves. So that that is something we would we do. Gosh, there's so many good follow-up questions that I have, and I'm sure the rest of the audience, but unfortunately we are at time. Um, I want to thank our great panelists for their thoughtful for this thoughtful discussion, Dr. Aaron Ramirez, Dr. Inez Ruiz-White, and and Diana Ruiz, hand of applause, please. And I want to thank you all for, for joining us in this session. Uh, please keep tweeting about the conference at CHCI HHM 2022. Oh, you got to put hashtag first, right? Because that's how people tweet. Uh, uh, please join us for our luncheon plenary, Achieving Our Dream, Latino Perspectives in America, me American Media and Entertainment. I'll end by saying this. Um, it's been a long three years. Um, and the reality is that when people talk about COVID having a disproportionate impact on black and brown communities, we are black and brown. Um, and so I want to encourage you all to keep the discussion going beyond these four walls. Um, and let's walk together towards healing. I really appreciate you being here today and enjoy the conference. Thank you.